Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, and so much more. And our first interview for the brand new year of 2017, Thomas Sheridan on the line. Thanks so much for joining us, man. Hey, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. It's it's absolutely my pleasure, and and somewhat you know embarrassingly, I have to say, I'm kind I'm kind of new to your work, and really, there's a one-two punch for me. And again, I of course will include everything in the links. Streetdruid.net is the main site, and then that gets to all your other stuff. And of course, I've already hit you up on the tweets. Just after the election, as the Trump riots broke out and they were happening right here in Portland, Oregon, one of the main kind of centers of it in a way, you had a video, and I'm not actually sure who, who turned me on to it or, or, or who linked me to it, where you talked about the people there rioting sort of metaphorically because they know their game is over. They know, and it sort of, I think, ties into the employment thing and, you know, the new robotization that's coming and the fight for 15 and minimum wage and all those sorts of things, that it was in a way they were protesting against sort of the end of their world in a way. And you can, can of course, expand on that in, in just a moment. But the second punch happened just a couple of days ago when you put up just a very brief blog post about celebrity deaths equaling the death of celebrity 2016 of course from the very beginning to the very end filled with the loss of you know again artists whose work i've loved throughout my life whether it's bowie or george michael or prince or any number of other people but it reached this kind of insane fever pitch and in your brief blog piece you kind of note that that's the death of the same thing. So this one-two punch that I'm kind of talking about, I really wanted you to expand and expound upon, you know, what people are really kind of mourning the loss of and are protesting the loss of. Yeah, well, the, the protesting thing was very interesting because I was watching them being interviewed on various channels. And when they would ask some specific questions of what they were protesting against, they couldn't give you a, a hard answer. It was almost like the anti-everything league, and it was a, there was a, an aspect of it was an element of confusion. It was it was very strange. I was looking at some of their faces, and there was sheer terror in some of them. The young people now, young people who are like white, middle class. I mean, they've got their lives ahead of them. They've got everything going for them. And the look of terror in their face would be like something you would expect to see in a war zone, as if you know it was the fall of Berlin and the the Russians were coming or something and I found this very interesting and then I started to think about like well the the sort of like the the psychosocial aspects of it and the Trump election was really now I'm not saying Trump is any kind of great savior the people he's put in his cabinet are a lot of them the, the typical globalists and stuff like that and I expected that that wasn't the issue for me but what I was delighted about his winning was it was because it rattled everything. It rattled everything. And that's usually good for societies. It's good for culture. It's good for people to knock them out of complacency and make them think about things. It's good for people to examine the paradigm and the associations which they often connect themselves to. Now, you have these people who see themselves, they're all on the left or they think they're on the left. They predominantly see themselves as the, vo the, the voice of the working classes. There's a kind of a quasi-socialist, uh, liberalist idea that they're, you know, this is where the working person, the working class person and the middle class person, they vote Democrat because they look after the, they look after our interest. And anyone who votes for Republican has to be a member of an exclusive golf club or there's some kind of redneck hillbilly or stuff. And lo and behold, what really frightened them was who actually voted for Trump. It was their people. It was their people, including many people who are actually going to support uh, Bernie Sanders, who absolutely would not give their vote to a psychopath like Hillary Clinton. And so this was suddenly the cozy normality of, the, of their lives was shattered. I'm a Democrat. I'm a good guy. You're a Republican. You're a bad guy. Only bad guys vote for you. Only good guys vote for us. And suddenly, the the the, the heart and soul of America, people who are not rednecks. I'm talking about the, you know yourself in the Rust Belt states. These would be people people who would be work classic like American working class type people, all voting for this guy who's a billionaire. And this this they could not understand this. They could not understand this. Uh, because they were trapped in the paradigm. So what happens then is that they, 
they, they develop kind of an internal rage. And this rage is really about themselves because they're realizing that they are dodos, that they are defunct. And that they, they, they cannot, it's the most strangest thing when people are kind of brainwashed. And a lot of them would be edu college educated. And I have this theory that the further you go through college, by the time you get to PhD level, you're completely a robot. You have no mind of your own left because you spend so much time. I'm not putting down people PhDs. I know there's lots of great ones out there. But I'm saying, in general, you tend to only get to that point by following orders. And there's always a safe, cozy consensus. The, 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 the tutor or the lecturer or the professor gives you certain things to do. You do them. You do as you're told. It works out. Well, these are people who've done what they've told all their lives. And this time, it hasn't worked out. And that's internalized rage. And that's projection. That's themselves. That's themselves putting themselves up on the, the greater schemes of things and throwing you know, knives and darts and arrows at themselves. And that's what that really was. And these people are obsolete now. And, this is, and they don't understand it's a good thing because now they have a chance to reset and begin again, to develop a new set of values going forward. But what happens is a lot of them have been so brainwashed by mass media, everything from MTV to all the mainstream media to even kind of, you know, uh, uh, cultural aspects. We're the cool guys. We would never vote for someone like him. It's all gone. And net a, sa a, a, a safety blanket has been pulled from them. And they're naked in the streets screaming. And that's what that was really all about. And I, I, I believe you also said, you know, we're lucky that the, you know, the vets, the unemployed, the people who have really kind of already lost something didn't come out to kind of meet those protests. Did you? Am I, I'm not putting words in your mouth, am I? Yeah. Well, you're right. There was no reason to. They'd won. This was, these, these were screams of death. These were post, you know, I, I would compare the behavior of those protesters to like post-mortal convulsions, a corpse like kicking its leg in the morgue. That's basically what that was. There was no reason for the vets to come out. There was no reason for, you know, steel workers, if there's any left, you know, to come out or anything like that, or people who work in the service industries. The reason, the reason for that was because the victory was absolutely total and decisive. Now, you can win an election in lots of ways. You can win an election according to the ballot. In America, you have a complicated system. Over here, we have proportional representation. Over there, you have the Electoral College and all that, which I understand why it exists. But the victory of Trump on the psychic level, on the on the psychic level, was an absolute decisive victory. So much so that it was filled with a sense of complete and total closure. And now the doors opened again. So there was, would have been no reason for any of that. And that's why they just allowed those riots to happen, those protests to happen, that screaming and shouting to happen. Like a toddler, they'll eventually fall asleep. And that's exactly what happened. Now, that's an interesting point, though, you said about the, the, those, these types, especially the vets. That's because they finally see really when you're looking for someone to represent you on a cultural level, it's really more cultural, <coughs> excuse me, more cultural and political. You look for someone who speaks your language, who operates within your mindset, who sees it's almost like a. A, a, a projection of you as a sort of a, an idealized version of your own dreams. And for these people, when they heard Bush say or Trump say things like uh, the, the treatment of vets are disgusting, they had the whole thing of grabbing by the pussy. They tried to make a big deal out of that. He didn't care. He apologized, which was actually very rare. You never see pol politicians apologize. And everyone said, I've said things like that. I'm used to be a stand-up comedian. I've said much worse than that. I've said these things all, you know, people have said things all their lives like this. This is how a lot of young fellas are. And then you get on with your life and move on. Okay, he wasn't a young fellow when he said it. But you know what I mean? This, this goes on. You're working on, anyone's ever worked in a construction site or factory. You hear this nonstop all the time. So this was a, that was their language. Even though he was a billionaire, he was talking like a fellow would talk in a steel mill. Exactly. And then he didn't he didn't apologize he, in a groveling kind of way. He just said it was immature. That's the end of it. Shut up and let's move on. Now, when you can talk to a person like that and those address in those ways, a sort of a sense of idealization in terms of a kind of like. And this is what happened to me with Trump. It's like this guy is different. He doesn't talk like a politician. So if he's not really a politician and he's not really a politician, he's a businessman. And you relate to him not as a politician. You're not going to go downtown to riot against the other side because you're no longer in a political world. You're in a very different place. Let's couple that with this other kind of loss and kind of crying out. All this year, and it was, you know, from 
I mean, 20, 2016 was basically kind of introduced with a giant new announcement from David Bowie. He had this huge album. It was kind of inscrutable. It came out on a Friday, which is kind of a somewhat new. Finally, you know, most places have what Friday is global release day. So all the records come out in the same place in the world now. So it was a big event. I know I even talked about it on my own morning show. Then by Monday morning, it was this kind of surprising death. And it was obviously done with much forethought and all. So in a way, 2016 was sort of introduced with a very kind of magical, you know, celebrity farewell from one of our kind of, you know, smartest, you know, obviously occult, knowledgeable musicians. And then the rest of the year was just peppered with, oh my God, this person died. Oh my God, this, and it was, you know, everybody from, which I did find interesting. I, you know, our, our sitcom parents, a couple of, you know, you know, the Brady Bunch, you know, Mrs. Brady died. It's that interesting thing where are we mourning again, the loss of this culture we realize now is fully and completely fake as all of these sort of scales fall from our eyes bowie was different though bowie didn't represent a fake culture if anything he represented the most realist of all culture we are very blessed in our lifetime i mean the first record i ever bought was life on mars i was in the single i was nine years old and it was the first single i ever bought and i didn't even understand what it meant back then but i can remember listening to those lyrics about when mickey mouse is growing up a cow and uh, it, it, this is like was a kind of a, an education for me at that early age. What does this mean? What's this all about? This is a, this is part of my own cultural and musical education. And uh, Bowie was very much a product of what everything that was right about the 20th century and the early 21st century. He represented the truest of all things. He represented, okay, yeah, you could say, okay, he had drug problems. He had like, uh, you know, he was, he went off the rails and stuff like that, but he did it with, he did it with meaning, you know, when he was, you know, on that tin white juke tour with that doing cracked actor, French kissing that skeleton. That was like, that was real. That was not a, a poser. That was not Miley Cyrus with a giant willy between her legs. That was, this was real. This was something that a, a person who was from say, a kid from the streets like me, all the way up to a college educated person could look at this guy and say, oh, he's really telling us something important. Now, before he died, some friends of mine who are not even into the things I'm into said, you have to see the video for Black Star. And, uh, and we were literally watching it on his iPhone. And Amicia knew what was happening. Well, Space Odyssey was part one. Uh, and then we had Ashes to Ashes as part two. It was all referenced all the way through it. And then part three, oh, it's a trilogy. That was the end of it. But I didn't think he was going to die. I thought maybe it's a relaunch of him as, as the ultimate superstar or something. You know, what would ever happen? Because it, this was like, it was a kind of an opus kind of thing. The whole song was long, was very involved. The, the, the video was full of tremendous, fantastic symbolism. And then it turns out, lo and behold, the man died, was dying of cancer. And then he was actually a guy who turned his debt into an art form. Now, <clears throat> that is an extremely rare thing. I, don't, I cannot think of it in too many other cases. We've had people's deaths being somehow turned into an art form post-mortal. Rudolf Valentino was one. Mozart was another. We, 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 they mythologized and, their, and almost like folklore of their deaths. But he was different. He was different. He actually managed his own, uh, you know, movement from this reality into the next as a true artist and it was at the same time this was happening reality on this plane in terms of the political paradigm the social paradigm was falling asunder you had brexit in the uk which basically was the beginning at the end of the european union you had very much the same kind of what i call post-mortal convulsions among the sort of the same type of you know uh demographic there as you got in Portland and the other US cities when, when Trump came in. It was exactly the same. We're in, and I'm telling you, James, I'm not lying when I say this, we are in an incredible point in history that we should be savoring, especially artistic and creative people. And when I say creative people, I don't necessarily mean artists. I mean, anyone who has a kind of a creative drive in some way. We are in a part where literally, I, I saw something on the TV the other day. It was an old ad. 
uh, on YouTube, an old TV ad or something. And you remember those old Japanese robots that had all the gears inside them and they would walk like this. And you put, and the, the thing, the battery was running down, the battery was running down. And then it stopped and it froze in a certain position. And then someone puts new batteries in and it begins again. And that's what we're at. We're at the point now where the batteries have run down, the gears will stop moving in the robot, and it's now time to put new batteries in. Now, it's, I know that we've lost the likes of Prince and all these amazing people, and especially Bowie. For me, that was like a shock, you know. But at the same time, too, I was talking to a friend the other day about this, and I said Bowie's force was so enormous, and so was Prince, that when they died, they shattered into a million charts, and they will continue on to inspire other people and other artists in future generations going forward, just like Mozart and everyone else has. And that is the sound, that, that, that smashing sound of one reality smashing into another. And it really is that simple. Uh, we are on the cusp of a new thing. And the most beautiful thing about it is them, what I call the psychopathic control grid, they're not in control of it. They are absolutely traumatized. Their whole globalization plans have definitely been disrupted, particularly in Europe. You think it's bad over there. You want to see the reaction. You want to see it over here. The European Union is like, it's, it's unbelievable. We have top European Eurocrats, uh, oligarchs and other types behaving like those writers in the street, like spoiled children. The media, the mainstream media has gone absolutely bonkers. It's completely, totally lost it. And so their world has gone as alternative media has getting bigger numbers, taken over and so on. We are now in charge in more or less. To, in, now, when I say in charge, we may not have the advertisers. We may not have the numbers, but what we have is retention. When people listen to people in alt media, people like myself, you and others, the, the audience listens. You know, the ones today, when they watch CNN or Fox or BBC, they don't retain it the same way maybe in the past they did with people like Walter Cronkite. Those days are over now for them in mainstream. We now have that aspect. We can now get into those people's heads and... and and mold them, hopefully in a good way, towards the new future. Reality is literally falling apart. It, this is probably something I never expected to see in my life. I thought towards the end of my life it would just go on the way it's always been going on. But 2016 was a year when literally I can't believe it. I look back in 2016, people are saying it was a terrible year. I don't know why whinging about it. Yeah, we lost people like Bowie, we lost other people. But at the same time, too, it was on a sort of like culturally awareness level. It was mind blowing. It was a hell of a ride. Did you not feel that way? I did. I found it a hell of a ride. I've honestly had a fantastic year. 2016, I relaunched Media Monarchy with the intention and drive of making it, you know, my work and, you know, making it my job. And that's what I did all through that year. And so while I'm sort of you know, build, building that and becoming excited and engaged, of course, seemed like all the things I'm talking about, all the news, all the coverage, all the, all the feelings, as of everyone, like you said, kind of withering away. And again, it's, it's, it depends on how you look at it. So we were kind of talking a, a few moments before we started to roll about these other times, though, because I guess I feel like as a little kid, you know, there was the, <laughs> the satanic panic. You know, I was a little kid in the early 80s. I grew up in a Baptist church at the time, and it was all the Russians are going to bomb us, Dungeons and Dragons, and backwards messages in records are killing your kids, and it seemed like an insane time. I got a little older, was able to research and look back and sort of see these peaks and valleys kind of go again. So I guess, I, am I being too defeatist to say, is this just, you know, is this just a peak and they're going to put another valley on because they'll crash the internet if they think they have to, to sort of cut off all the voices. Yeah, I think I think your, your vigilance is well, you know, is, is well validated. This is how they think. They're they're crazy at the end of the day. They're crazy and they're also kind of immature. When I say immature, I don't mean like they're like little kids. They're immature in terms of their creativity. A lot of them operate in crisis management. Angela Merkel in Germany is a classic example of that. She, I don't think she's ever made a proper decision in her life. She lets, if she, if her, you know, if her house roof was leaking, she'd let the roof collapse and then say, oh, it's collapsed now, let's fix it. That's the kind of, that's, a, that's actually a very kind of a Bolsheviki 
European uh, Marxist kind of idea. That'll fall apart and then we'll create a new thing to fix it. And that's that's what they're like. Uh, we just have to maintain vigilance too. We have to be always one step ahead. The one, one of the things that will always make me feel great about the whole Trump thing was how people used memes. You know where the Trump really won? Was the Trump people were used had hilarious memes. The Clinton side had stupid memes. Comedy and satire, the jester spirit came flying out and won the day. It was something refreshingly working class about it, where you got, you know, like it's a kind of like the kind of the kind of sense of humor you would get on construction sites. Very witty, very quickly. You could see it was kind of working class guys who were doing are very like sort of like tuned in, sort of educated people. But on the you could just you just just you just knew by reading the Clinton memes and seeing them they were made by some someone who was like a you know a, a social studies graduate or something like that. Absolutely no sense of humor, and that 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 played a huge part in it. And that was a really kind of like heartwarming thing for me that we can still change the world and we can still disrupt and stop someone from Hitler Clinton starting World War III uh, through something as simple as taking the piss. It goes back to what we're saying about the alternative media, is that we pretty much completely kind of took it over and have won, and unless they, they wreck the joint, we would probably continue to win. Let me ask you about your thoughts going forward into 2017 and, and what you're excited about or worried about or, or interested in going forward. Uh, I'm, worried, I'm worried about only one thing on the global scale, and that's Obama in the few days left will stir the pot so thick with Russia and Syria that and put so much paranoia, middle class paranoia out there about Russia that it will create a situation in the world that might be, shall we say, edgy. But I don't think it's going to work. In terms of the future for alt medium, the only way they'll ever co-opt it, well, see, they will try to take it over. They will try. You will see them. You will see the likes of the uh, the mainstream media covering more of the topics we do. That's what you will see. But they'll do it very badly. They'll do it very badly. Uh, or, or else they will try to offer money to people who are in this scene to go work for them. Very likely, some people will be approached. Good luck to do if they're asked. I have not a problem with that. Uh, but that's how they'll try and do it. And then they'll try and say, oh, you know, you had the two-year contract. Now here's your third-year contract. You have to talk about other things. You know, that may happen. That's how it would happen. You sell your soul to the devil, they will make you pay for it. But I wouldn't hold it against anyone who would want to do that and for, you know, for, for financial reasons. Because a lot of people have spent years putting a lot into this and got nothing from it in terms of finance. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't resent them. But that's how they'll probably try to do it. In terms of the political scene, they're going to sit down and look at Brexit. They're going to sit down and look at Trump. And they're going to say, what happened to the left that it lost the working classes? And obviously, answer to that is globalization. So you've got globalization. I don't know how it is in, in the US, but here in Europe, the big thing is, is basically we don't have national sovereignty anymore they, they basically Angela Merkel was flooding Europe with uh, immigrants and what we call them migrants and refugees and everything and it's it's uh, it's just that's people are uncomfortable with that it's not a racist thing it's just that they're uncomfortable with the numbers and the amount that's happening so quickly and you instead of them people being called racist and this kind of thing or in America calling them rednecks and you know KKK you will have a more sympathetic approach on the surface on a superficial level that oh maybe their 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 you know their feelings are justified maybe they're not racist we have to be understanding you're going to get a lot of that kind of nonsense an awful lot of that kind of nonsense will come up and that's what will happen because the people in mainstream media just like politicians they hold they hold their finger in the air and say which way is the wind blowing that's what I am this week that's what I like they're complete fakes they're complete complete phonies and that's what will happen I there's there's a perfect example of that this very day megan kelly from fox news announces she's going to nbc yeah so that's yeah. i th you know I, I i saw it when you know the bush years were wrapping up and there was someone like keith olbermann and i saw it kind of coming that you know 
These guys, as soon as the guy with the R after his name is out, they think their job is done, and I called it. Keith Olbermann stopped doing hardcore news and went back and did sports during the majority of the Obama years. Now that the Obama years were wrapping up, he's back on and he's doing his thing, kind of playing his part in the kind of partisan partisan thing you're exactly talking about. Yeah, because the, the death of politics, the death of celebrity, and the death of mass media, they're all tied in. It's a three-headed serpent that's put, being put down, and it's dying, and it needs to replenish itself with new blood. And this is how it, it, it'll change the goalposts for a while, and then it will try to absorb what it thinks has defeated it. But ultimately, I think when I look at what globalization is attempting to achieve, to me, it's completely unsus unsustainable over the long term. Unless, you know, the Soros Foundation and all these, you know, all this weird stuff he's brought from Russia over the over the years, everything from mind control to occult and stuff like that, the ways of controlling people that the old Bolsheviks used, it, unless they do something like literally mind control is true, like TV rays or something like that, they have a hell of a job, a hell of a job ahead of them. The transhumanist thing is probably what they were really aiming for. That's kind of all gone you know, it's petered out for them in many ways. I think uh, I think we've got, what we have here is a few years of tranquility. I think if we have a few years where they're going to regather up their, their cards, think about it, and in the meantime, we can cause chaos for them. I intend to be an enormous shit store for the next few years, and uh, I have, I'm looking forward to it. And I want to, and I hope other people do, that we continue on doing what we're doing and try to co-opt them at every turn. Because remember, they're not as creative and clever as they think they are. If they were, they would have got, they would have got Brexit trashed and they would have got Clinton in. And they failed miserably. And just think about this, James. The entire entertainment industrial complex was on the side of Hillary Clinton in its entirety almost. Right in, down to the very end, Right. And it failed miserably. The same thing happened with Brexit in, in the UK. It failed miserably. The s people don't listen to celebrities anymore. The celebrities we cared about, like Prince and Bowie, are all dead. We, they were the ones we liked. They're gone. So who's left? We're not going. To, we're not going to be swayed by, you know, some guy who was on a sitcom ten years ago, or Miley Cyrus, or even George Clooney. And George Clooney, I would, I would, I would love to have. Being in George Clooney's shoes, the night that is very expensive shoes, the night that Trump won, because I, he was mocking and joking and talking about this, and he must have thought, how could anyone, how could have a problem with me? I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm on the Council of Foreign Relations. I'm, a, I'm a big shot. But I've seen, I've even seen the wind knocked out of U2 sales. Bono was Mr. Anti-Trump on Charlie Rose, who's also, I believe, CFO as well, and a Bilderberger, and he's doing the same. Well, the New Year message this year from you from you too was just about oh the the thirtieth anniversary of Joshua Tree is coming up. See ya. The, nothing political. So maybe they've seen the writing on the wall. At least he has. So that's what I'm saying. We're going to have a few years of tranquility, and I think culturally it might get very good. But what I do worry about in alt media, like you said, the satanic panic thing, Pizzagate being a classic example of that. Yes, Pizzagate does have very real occult, and I mean that in the very broader sense, things going on regarding possible bizarre behavior, sexual or otherwise, surrounding the outsider art scene, which has always been, to me, a very dodgy and peculiar and fascinating scene I've tried to get a closer look at, and I don't like what I see. At the same time, too, you will have the the people who are screaming satanic this, satanic that, and all this kind of this kind of thing. And this is what we have to be careful of. I'll give you an example. See, a lot of stuff when they use as soon as I hear the word satanic, I know they're idiots. I, I I I turn off immediately. I turn off immediately, and I'll tell you why. That is a kind of like a trigger word they use to use a social justice warrior term, a trigger word to, for other people on the on, on the right side. In Northern Ireland in the nineteen seventies. The British Army used to plant in certain streets where they wanted to uh, monitor the IRA in abandoned houses, uh, black magic paraphernalia. They used to, so this all came out in government in documents. They used to paint uh, 
you what you call it stars on the floor pentagrams put pictures of satan up leave books on satanic mass and all this thing around to give the idea that these houses were being used by satanists what they were really being used was they were for listening stations to listen in on ira communications clever but that has been used for a long time the words when people satanic is a word when people hear it, they don't first of all they don't know what it means and secondly they make all kinds of like horror movie assumptions you know their minds run wild so we have to be very careful when we use terms like a cult and stuff like that we think in different terms very often in terms of pizzagate there's something funny going on there uh, i'm not a christian so i don't run to that and i wasn't right i wasn't raised in that kind of what you were in that kind of like christian tradition i was playing Dungeons and dragons i played in a goth band so i was clean of all that but yes that's the thing to watch out for uh it's a great time it'll be calm it'll be easy it'll be interesting but we all have to look out for our games that well that's what i would say for a while for a while and i i appreciate talking to and again i i think i i like talking to you um and i've talked to some other folks i don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named robert phoenix Talked no. to him recently about because I had heard him talking about Trump's sort of astrological signs as he was sort of coming in and what may come and what may not come and I put this video up on my YouTube channel and everybody gets all mad. I'm talking about the occult and why would he have this guy on and in a way it's like I'm having this on because we're demystifying I think a lot of these a lot of these areas. I have a report here. This was commissioned by the this was commissioned by the Soros Foundation in nineteen ninety one. And what it was was a lecture at Fordham University, which was actually to discover what methods the Russians and Soviet used on the occult and could we bring them to the United States. And so the whole thing is they want us laughing at the occult, but meanwhile they're using it. They're not sitting around going hocus pocus and dressed in robes. They understand uh, fundamentally at some level it's to do with mind control. It's to do with perception and changing people's cognitive awareness in terms of bringing about realities in the world. That's all that means. It means nothing else. And supernaturalism is things like a Super Bowl halftime show. It's to take you away. To an ultimate reality and stick in a bloody political agenda. You know, so you have this incredible show, this incredible thing, heightened emotions, and then they say, don't forget to pay your carbon taxes. That's an act of ritual magic. That's all that is. It's just a, a way of just getting into your brain and planting a seed that lasts forever. That's all it is. And the occult is a very valid thing to study once Christians are kept out of it. No offense, Christians, but you tend to be panicky. But that's that's it, that's it. That, well, that is it, man. And that's why I, I love talking to you. That's why I wanted to reach out to you. That's why I'd like to continue to talk to, talk to you more through 2017, man. Yeah, it'd be a pleasure. Come on. Delighted. Fantastic. Thomas Thank Sheridan, you, the website is streetdruid.net. I really appreciate you coming on and hope to talk to you more throughout the year, man. Thanks so much. All the same. Thank you. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005. Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.